may know what this is. Jason, you know what it is. Come on, I mean, let me, let, hold on just a second. Jess knows, Jason knows, where's Eric? Eric knows, Tony knows. Okay, I could go on and on, but I won't. I would never be, okay? This is the phoenix. The phoenix is a mythological bird that would burn up into a bunch of ashes, but then it had the power to regenerate itself, right? Well, all of our lives, my life, since I had kids, we played games, cards or something, whatever it was. And the moment I started to lose, this is what I would say to them. Have I ever told you about the phoenix? And they'd say, oh, no. I said, let me tell you about the phoenix. Let me tell you about the phoenix. It's a mythological bird. It burned up in the ashes. Then it restored. But that's me, and you're going to lose. And because of the looks on their faces over there, you know that it's mostly true all the time. It wasn't too long ago, was it, Eric? We were on the golf course. Me and you and Jimmy Campbell. I hope he's listening. Jimmy Campbell and Joe Piotti. I don't think Joe's here. Right? We're playing in a par three tournament. Joe and I weren't playing too good. Eric and Jim were playing well. All of a sudden, Eric, or not Eric, he's not this dumb. Joe, all of a sudden, Jim started to trash talk. What? Where's on number nine? Yeah, he's over going. I said, I said, you, Jimmy, were you trash talking? I said, I ever tell you about the Phoenix. Eric went, oh, no. <laughs> I said, Jimmy, mark this right here. Right here. I'm going to mark this. I'm going to put a circle on this hole right here. Because I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to point back to this moment. Because at the end, you're going to lose. You're, you're going to lose. And that's going to be the mark right there. Yes, that's exactly what happened. <laughs> that's right. I am the Phoenix. But it came back from the ashes. I want to talk to you today, a message entitled, Beauty for Ashes. Beauty from Ashes. Isaiah 61 is obviously the scripture we're talking about. The, uh, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and one of the things to do was to bestow a garland or a beauty for ashes. But I want to take you to a story found in 2 Samuel that will set up a terrible moment in a person's life that left them in ashes. All right? How many of you have ever had an ash moment? Right? Be careful to mention the H. I've had lots of those other ones. Tamar. Tamar was David's, King David's daughter who had a brother named Amnon, also another brother named Absalom. All right? So the Bible says that this is what happened. Amnon took a liking to his sister. He wanted to be with his sister. He wanted to, 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 to go to bed with her. He wanted this thing with his sister. And so here's what happened. So he br brings her, tricks her, deceives her, rapes her. Okay, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, Tamar put ashes on her head and tore an ornate robe she was wearing. See, ashes in the Bible represent grief, death, mourning. It represents humiliation, worthlessness, insignificance. Anybody ever felt like they had ashes on? Right? So what's what happened? When she came into the room, this is what happened. But when she took the food to him to eat, he grabbed her and said, come to bed with me, my sister. No, my brother, she said to him, don't force me. Such a thing should not be done in Israel. Don't do this wicked thing. What about me? Where could I get rid of this disgrace? And what about you? You would be like one of the wicked fools in Israel. Please speak to the king. He will not keep me from being married to you. But he refused to listen to her. And since he was stronger than she, he raped her. Hmm. So here he is. This son of the king, brother of the princess, wickedness, sin, lust out of his own evil heart, not God, right? This wickedness arises in her, him, and he wants her, and he forces himself, and he does, takes her. Because he was stronger than her, more powerful her than he could prey upon her. Do you know what? Here's the fact of the matter. In this room today, there are some of you that someone more powerful than you took what they should have never taken. There are some of you in this building today that you're reflecting right now and saying, you know what, that should have never happened to me. And had I been stronger than that person, it wouldn't have happened to me. But because they were stronger and they were more powerful, they did this to me. And, and, and not only did they, some of you, it's physical. You know what, though? How many know when Amnon raped his sister, it was more than physical? It was emotional. It was mental. It was all those things combined. They, the, the, these people, they rape you with their words. They rape you with their body. They rape you with their actions. They take from you what they should have never taken. They take what you, for, that should have never been taken from you. 
They raped you with emotional abuse. And if you're offended by the word rape, I put it there on purpose. I didn't want the version that said he slept with her. No, he didn't. He raped her. And then watch this. Then it says that after he did that, then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, get up and get out. Hmm. Isn't it interesting? He hated her because she was a reminder of what he did and who he was. He hated her. Listen to me. They hate you because of you, because you are a reminder of what they did and who they are. There are some people who came against you, did things to you, took things from you. There are people who sinned against you. There are people who did it, and they hate you and reject you. And they do that not because of you. They do it because of them, and you're a vivid reminder of who they are. And how many know we don't like to be reminded of who we are? Right? Because of what they did to you, they now want to drive you out of their life. I'll never have to deal with this again. And she says, no. Sending me away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, get this woman out of my sight and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. And she was wearing an ornate robe. She was the princess. She had an ornate robe. It would have been a robe of royalty. It would have been a robe of virginity. Wearing it. And she went out. That this kind of garment was the virgin daughters of the king wore. And Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the robe that she was wearing. And she put her hands on her head and went away weeping loud as she went. Get the picture. Get the picture. This man violated her. This man took from her. This man did all these things. He stole from her the beauty and the innocence that were hers. Beauty and innocence that belonged to her. How many know sin steals beauty and innocence? It steals beauty, okay? One of the greatest tragedies of the sin in the garden was the loss of innocence. They, they were naked and had no shame, right? I mean, they didn't have a clue. What? Huh? Until their eyes were open and they knew they were naked. And the reason their eyes were open is they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And when they sinned, innocence was gone. How many can you remember a moment in your life where sin robbed you of innocence? Your sin, others' sin. And then they tried to cover their nakedness. And the story goes on. That then her brother Absalom said to her, has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet for now, my sister. He's your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother Absalom's house, a desolate woman. Isn't it amazing that the brother's trying to be kind, compassionate, and says, don't take this thing to heart. I mean, no. Sometimes we're pretty glib in our advice. Sometimes we're pretty glib when we're looking at the person who's gone through the abuse, the person who's gone through it, and we're trying to tell them, oh, suck it up, buttercup, it'll get... All right? We're trying to tell them, well, don't take it to heart. How many know, that? How many know you're going to take that to heart? Right? And you got to remember, here's what also happens. Not only did he sin against her, he did, but then he created an Absalom, a heart that would sin by killing Amnon one day. Tamar, the daughter of the king, was left with a torn garment of beauty and a desolate life in ashes. You know what the tragedy of this story is? The tragedy of this story is it ends right there for Tamar. We never see a redemptive thread from that point on. We don't know what it's, we don't know. Okay, but what we do know is who God is, right? And that's what we're going to talk about. We're not going to spend all of our time talking about Tamar, but I wanted to set it up. How did the ashes come into her life? You see, in this room today, there are modern-day Tamars who have been living in ashes. There's modern-day Tamars that somebody may have raped you physically, Maybe it wasn't that. Maybe it was with their words. Maybe it was with their actions. Maybe it was with how you were raised. It could be any number of things that has left you in a desolate place and left you in a place of ashes. But here's the good news. But today, God is going to plant the seeds to bring beauty from ashes. He's going to do that this morning if you allow him. Well, how does it happen? 
let's talk about, first of all, the promise. How many know there's a promise that comes with the anointed one? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, Isaiah 61, which Jesus repeated in Luke chapter 4. This is what the promise was. The Spirit of the Lord, God, is upon me because he's anointed me to bring good news to the humble. How many know the anointed one is Jesus? Right? To proclaim release to the captives and freedom to the prisoners. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. To comfort all those who mourn. To grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes or beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning. The cloak of praise instead of a disheartened spirit. So they will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Look at these real quick. We'll go through these real quick. The Bible says the spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach good news. How many know it's the good news of a kingdom, not of this world? How many know it's the kingdom, the, the good news of a king and a kingdom, not of this world? How many know Jesus is unlike any other person you've ever met? Jesus is unlike any other man you've ever met, ladies. He's like unlike any other woman you've ever met, men. Jesus is, he is the good news. He in the kingdom, right? The promise of healing. He came with a promise of healing for wounded hearts. If you've got a wounded heart today, there's a promise in Scripture that he'll bind it up. He's close to the brokenhearted. He comforts those who mourn. That's the promise of Scripture. The promise is freedom for the prisoner and the captives. How many know the things that have happened in your, in your life can sometimes hold you hostage? They hold you captive. They hold your thoughts captive. They hold you back. Those labels we talked about last week, they become limitations on your life. All your life you've been saying, I would do this, but I was told I'm too stupid. I would do this, but I was told I'm not good enough. I would do this, but I was told I would never, I'd never be enough. But Jesus said, I come to set the captive free. He came with the promise of vengeance upon our enemy. I mean, no, it's God's to avenge. I mean, no, it sure feels good to fantasize about. <laughs> I've had a few fantasies in my life. <laughs> right? I know, not you, but uh, you should think how many times I've killed you. I mean, <laughs> I mean we, 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 we fantasize, don't we? We like to, we, I mean, we want them to pay. I mean, how many know justice is a God thing? How many know vengeance is a God thing? God's vengeance will be just. And he will bring it against the enemy of your soul, Satan. How many know he does? How many know he'll bring it against the enemies in your life? God does that, not you. Then he brought the promise of beauty for ashes. The promise of gladness instead of mourning. How many know you can do both? Ten years in May, I've done both for ten years. I mourn my son, I got the joy of the Lord. How they work, how that one works, I don't know. How's it there? Don't know, it's just there. Can't talk, I, I don't know. I'm not sure I'll figure that out. <laughs> if I figured it out, then I probably wouldn't have it anymore. The promise to give you praise instead of despair. How many of that just ticks the devil off? How many of that just ticks the devil off when you're praising God when he wants you to despair over what he just did to you? You really want to tick the devil off? Lift up a shout of praise. Just shout and say, God. Like, I, I, I love to harass people. Yeah, honest. I mean, it's a gift. It's a gift. I really love to harass him. You see, but here's what you got to understand about this beauty. Beauty for ashes is not the work of the redeemed to get. It's the work of the redeemer or the Redeemer. It's the work of the Redeemer that we receive. It's not us striving to get it, and well, I, gotta, I gotta do this, and I gotta do No, 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 no. It's His work. How many know you go to the doctor, and all you do to get your healing is follow His directions? Unless you're my mother. <laughs> well, you see, I only took half of one doc because I did this, and I'm sitting there going, oh my God. <laughs> all right? You see, we, we value and make it. It's this work I got to strive for and I got to work for. There's things you got to do, but I mean, no, it's his work. Healing is the work of the Redeemer. It's what he does, and we receive it. But here's the question. The hardest part about preaching these messages isn't preaching the promise that God says. God says I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this. That's the easy part. The hard part is giving people a how. Because how many of us, what we really want? What we really want is the how, right? 
I don't have one. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> well, maybe a little bit. But how? But how does it happen? So I got to thinking about this. I think this first thing we're going to mention is incredibly, incredibly important. If you're going to find healing from the anointed one, if you're going to get healing from the redeemer, this first one is so important. You must believe God is not the author of your ashes. You must be- <laughs> It is amazing and appalling to me the number of times I hear people say, well, that little girl was raped, but God had a divine purpose for it. No, he did not. Well, honey, you don't understand. God had a divine purpose. No, he did not. How do you get this little girl to believe that God is the author of her ashes? How do we, how do we reconcile that with what Scripture says? Then that means that God must have tempted that person when the Bible says that God doesn't tempt anyone to do evil. That God himself can. And yet we say this stuff. Oh, well, he's in control. No, he's not in control of everything. It wouldn't have happened if he was in control of everything. We have bad theology that sets people up. You see, because here's my question. If he's the author of your ashes, why would you trust him to be the bestower of your beauty? I'm not going to the heart doctor who gives me heart disease. I'm not going to the brain doctor who gives me brain tumor. Say, you might want to go to the brain doctor. I know what you're thinking. I'm not going to the mechanic who breaks my car so he can fix my car. Do you understand what we're saying about God sometimes? Well, God had this plan. No, he didn't. Somebody sinned. They sinned against God and they sinned against you. You cannot believe. You must lose the notion that God had anything to do with the ashes of your life. You see, because the fact of the matter is, sometimes Satan is the author of the ashes in your life. You have an enemy seeking whom he may devour. You have an enemy that looks to steal, kill, and destroy. You have an enemy like Job had, who wreaked havoc in his life. Sometimes there are things in your life that are ashes, that are nothing but a direct attack of the enemy to get you to curse God. Sometimes it's someone else that was the author of the ashes of your life. That person who abused you. That person who rejected you. That kid that's rebellious. Talking about my sisters. <laughs> By the way, my niece is here again. And hey guys, she's single, smart, going to be a doctor. Just telling you. <laughs> Trying to help you. It could be a mom. It could be a dad. Brother, sister. Uncle, aunt. Grandparents. Pastors. Teachers. Someone else with the author of your ashes. Sometimes, let's be honest, sometimes it's us, it's self, that was the author of the ashes of our life. And everybody ever made some decisions that created some ashes? Hmm? That you made some ashes. And yet, what do we do when we make our own ashes? The devil made me do it. No, he didn't. Well, if you wouldn't have done it, no, stop, stop, stop. It's your fault. Everybody say, my fault. Okay? I take accountability. I got weak on that one. Sometimes you kind of just say, listen, it was me. I created this mess. I created these ashes. Sometimes it's just life, gang. Life has situations that are the author of some of the ashes. People die. I mean, we're heartbroken. Spouses die at some point. You can have kids die. Sickness, disease, hardship, life, just life, hardship. Let me say, go back to Tamar for a moment. God was not the author of her ashes. He was not. God had nothing to do with the Amnon raping Tamar, and therefore there was no divine purpose for it. Now, I'm not saying, we'll talk in a minute, that God can't bring something good out of something evil, but he did not have a divine purpose to create it. He is not the originator of it, and he is not the author of it. There was no divine purpose for what happened to you at the hand of another. Sweetheart, there was no divine purpose behind it. None. 
And if anybody ever told you that, it's a lie from the pit of hell. It was sin. It was sin against God. It was satanic purpose. And it was not and never will be the purpose of God for your life. I mean, the church better start speaking truth in these things. We're so, we get so freaked out that God might not look all uh, like, he, like, like he might not be in control. Well, he's not in control of all things. The Bible teaches that. But yet we give bad theology because it freaks us out. We'd rather, we'd rather make him look less good than less powerful. God is not the author of your ashes, but he is Lord over the ashes. Come on. He is Lord over the ashes. You see, here's what we got to do. We got to stop assigning a divine purpose to someone else's sin. That this man comes and sins against this woman, and then we have a tendency to say, but God had a divine purpose for it. No, he didn't have a divine purpose for it. No, he didn't. We like to assign. We, we, we go around, we spend our life sometimes looking for the divine purpose for why that happened. There is no divine purpose. It was sin. It wasn't from God. Man, it frees us. But then it takes me to the second point. Okay. But then what does happen? So now I got to go to the second point. If God's going to do beauty in, for ashes, I got to come to the second point. And it's this that I must believe God has a redemptive plan for what wasn't his divine purpose. You see, we often confuse divine purpose and redemptive plan. A redemptive plan is God's ability to redeem what wasn't his divine purpose. Right? Uh, you go back into the garden. He put Adam and Eve in the garden. He gave them everything they needed. He gave them everything they needed to eat from the tree of this and this and this and eat. Eat from the tree of life and live forever. That tree, don't eat from it. That's mine. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That's my divine purpose for your life. My divine purpose for your life is to live forever. My divine purpose for your life is to be a steward of my creation. But man sinned. And when he sinned, innocence was stolen. Death came into the world. That wasn't God's divine purpose. But God did provide a redemptive plan, didn't he? He did say it one day, the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. That he created this redemptive plan. The Bible, if you look at the Bible, you want to see the Bible is a story of how God provides a redemptive plan for when his divine purpose gets messed up. I mean, no, it wasn't his divine purpose for the Israelites to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. That wasn't his plan. That came about because of sin. But he provided a redemptive plan to still bring them back to the promised land. You see, what happened in your life was not God's divine purpose. But I'm promising you this morning that he can provide a redemptive plan to bring beauty out of those ashes. I promise you that. You see, a redemptive plan is God's ability to bring something good out of something bad. There was no divine purpose for you being abused, but there is a redemptive plan. There was no divine purpose. You can trust God because he wasn't the author of your ashes. There was no divine purpose for being rejected. But there is a redemptive plan. There is no, oh, same one. There is no divine purpose for you to have been raped. But there is a redemptive plan. You say, well, pastor, you're using that word. That's all right. Want to know what I said earlier about Kayla? You don't want to know. I'll just tell you. I don't care. I said to a couple people up here, see that little girl? Some of them know. I said, that's a modern day Tamar, and it pisses me off. Sorry. Mom, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry a bit. You're darn right. It makes me so angry inside that somebody would steal from that little girl, that the enemy of her soul would steal and abuse and rape, and then people would tell her God had a plan. No, he didn't have a plan. The enemy had a plan to destroy her. You ever feel like a gangster? <laughs> oh, I mean, a gangster for God. There was no divine purpose for your child's death, but there is a redemptive plan. There was no divine purpose for Nick's death. It was a result of many things. Bad choices, 
his part, other parts. But I don't once ever look at God and say, you took him. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. But God has a redemptive plan. There was no divine purpose for your husband or wife's affair, but there is a redemptive plan. There's no purpose for your child's addiction, but there is a redemptive plan. Somebody told me one time years ago, years ago, and they said, well, you know, they, God, God allowed Nick to get on drugs so that you would understand how, what, time out. You're telling me that God put my kid on drugs? That he could have kept him off and didn't? You're telling me that? I ain't serving that God. That's just stupid. Let me stop with the dumb theology. Can we just stop with the stupid theology and think we have to explain for God every time something bad happens in somebody's life? There's an evil one who's out to inflict as much pain and harm at people as they can, and we need to be, uh, we need to be vindicating God rather than trying to explain for God. He is not the author of your ashes, but he is the author of your beauty because he has a redemptive plan for your ashes. Let me say a couple things. Beauty for ashes comes out of a redeemer redeemed relationship. Gang, if you don't have a relationship with the redeemer, he can't bring beauty for ashes. It is the work of the redeemer to be received by the redeemed. He does the work in you. Randy, did you receive a work by the surgeon when you were in Pittsburgh? And you received that work and things went well, right? Well, took a bit, right? <laughs> Okay? But the reason that you're sitting here today and you can put sentences together is because you received the work that was done in your body and the, work, the, the, the result is here you are. It is the same thing with Jesus. There is a redeemed redeemer relationship that he wants to speak and sow into you that flows out of that flows healing. Beauty from ashes flows from, comes from his redeeming spirit who lives in the redeemed. So get this. So Jesus says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to do this. Preach good news to the poor. Bind up the brokenhearted. Give beauty for ashes. All these things, right? He's saying the spirit of the Lord is upon me to do this. But the same spirit that's on me to do this is the same spirit that lives in you to will that. That lives inside of you. How many know there's a work to be done from the inside out by the spirit of the anointed one who now lives in you? Beauty for ashes comes from the redeeming words in the redeemed. How many know that Jesus used a parable that were soil? Right? And that soil had words sown into it, the word of God. And that word that was sown into good soil produced a harvest a hundred times. How many know we have to receive the redeeming words of God into our life? Come on, Troy. You saying already? Oh, we ain't done yet. Let me show you something. I was cooking hot dogs. You know what that is? Some of you know. Right there. That's your shreddings from last week. That's your label, envelope, shredding from last week. I told them, I said, don't you throw those away. I want them. And I took them last night and I put them in a thing and I burned them. They're gone. They're nothing but ashes. They're nothing but ashes. You see, this is what was left. We had ashes. But let me show you what happens. Look at this. You got underneath the redeemed. I mean, that's you and I. We're the redeemed of the Lord. I want you to look at the top. He's the redeemer. I mean, the redeemer is always the head. In between, he puts his spirit in us, and he puts his seed in us. And what's left is that. Listen to me this morning. The Bible promises beauty from ashes. And that beauty from ashes comes when you come to a place where you say, wait a minute. God, I get it. You're not the author of my ashes. You never were. People told me you were. People told me you had divine purpose behind it. But today, I understand that you do not have, you did not have a divine purpose for what happened in my life. That Satan had a purpose. Someone else had a purpose. I did it to myself some. But God, it wasn't you. It was 
what I did. I have something for everybody. I got these little, I don't know, things. Pots. I took the ashes from your shredding. And I mixed them with some good soil. They tell me ashes are actually a fertilizer for stuff to grow. Where's George? He'll correct me if I'm wrong. So, something like that, George? Close enough? Maybe good. If not, just nod and I won't tell you anybody you lied. Because <laughs> I don't really like to plant anything. But I took this. See, I want you to know something. This right here, this thing right here, that's you. You are this container. That's you. And you got some ashes in your life. But let me tell you what my God's done. He's taken some of his word and some of the good dirt and he puts it in here. And you're going to take it home. And you're going to plant a seed in it. I didn't give you seeds. You say, well, pastor, let me tell you why I didn't give you seeds. All of your ashes aren't from the same thing. All of the stuff that happened not from the same thing. And some of you need a different seed for a different fruit. You got to go pick the seed. And how many know planting a seed is a step of faith? How many know planting a seed is a step of faith? You take that seed, you put it in this ground, and you believe that God's going to make it grow. You see, this is the same thing this morning, folks. You are the one. You have some ashes. You have some dirt. You have some soil. You're, the, you're this vessel of God. And the Redeemer wants to do a work, and he wants to bring beauty for ashes. And he does it by doing it with his spirit and his word that he sows into you. But you have to put a seed of faith to it. Come on. you got to put a seed of faith to it. So this is what I want you to do. i got a song that we're going to sing. And I'm gonna, we're going to do this kind of like communion, okay? Just make your way up. Get one of these. And then just go back to your seat for a moment. If you would just, and, and just indulge me for a moment, okay? So as we sing, come get one. Go back to your seat. Let me ask you to bow your head. Close your eyes. He will bring beauty from ashes. He will give beauty for ashes. But it flows first from a relationship between the redeemed and the redeemer. Jesus is the redeemer. And all those who put their faith in him and give their lives to him, they're the redeemed. We can't go any further this morning until I look in everything and say, are you the redeemed of the Lord here this morning? Are you ones? That have you accepted what Christ did on Calvary? You, you see, if you want those ashes to become something that produces beauty, you got to start with accepting him as redeemer. If you're here this morning, you've never done that. You want to do that today? You say, today I make him my redeemer. Today I step into a redeemed, redeemed relationship. Raise your hand nice and high. Anybody here today, you want to say, I'm making Jesus the redeemer of my life today. It's going to take a couple minutes. Raise it nice and high. I'll have somebody come pray with you. You know him as Lord. You know him as Savior. You know if you die today, you'll be with him. If you don't, Today's your day. I'll count to three. One. Anybody want to raise your hand? Two. Three. It's okay, because here's the deal. You can do this in your car. You can do it in your bedroom. There's no notch on my gun belt to get you to raise your hand here giving you an opportunity for everybody else I want you to look at that container that you hold you're holding that container and you're looking at it it's a pretty ugly container actually that was by design it's like ugly little cardboard and it's got inside it some ashes that came from your stuff. It's got some dirt in it. 
and you're going to go home and you're going to plant a seed in it of something that's going to grow that you want to grow somebody said to me what if it doesn't grow oh, no no I got, I, got a, I got a great answer for that it's your fault the word of God never fails it, it, they're just telling you it's seed is the word of God it never fails the only reason the seed doesn't sow in this guy isn't because of the seed it's because of the guy alright so if it doesn't grow plant another seed and if that one don't grow plant another stinking seed plant those suckers so they grow but every seed takes faith to sow Some of you you got the ashes of failure in your life. So did Peter. God came with a redemptive plan. The woman caught in adultery wasn't God's divine purpose for her life. She had some ashes there. God, Jesus had a redemptive plan. Whatever it is, whatever the ashes are, God has a redemptive plan. And he's going to bring beauty out of ashes. Jesus was standing before the people of the city of Jerusalem. And he makes this kind of comment, if you, even you, he, he's being very specific here, he's saying, like you, I'm not talking to somebody else. It's an interesting pastor, sometimes people will say to us who preach, you're, you were preaching at me. You, you were just preaching at me. I know you were. And I say, yeah, of course I was. If you were in the audience, I was preaching at you. I'm guilty. Jesus is saying to the people of Jerusalem, if you, only you, or even you, had have known this day what would bring you peace. Other translations say, if you'd only know that this was the day of your visitation, that something special was about to happen, but you missed it. He actually goes on to say, you missed it. I was talking to a preacher this week, and he said to me, God is visiting our church in a divine way. We're hearing it on secular news media that God is visiting American college campuses. We are hearing about wars and rumors of wars, but we are what? To be depressed? No, we're to lift up our heads for our redemption is drawing nigh. This is a day in which God is visiting us. I say to you, and I came in here this morning, that scripture hit me. Sometimes, why do I come late sometimes? It's because I work on Sunday mornings and I, got, I looked at the clock and it was after 10 when I left my workplace and I raced here. I don't drive like some of you, but I did eventually got here. But here's the deal. This is a day of visitation for Transformation Church. The Spirit of the living God is visiting us. Don't miss it. Here's a divine warning. Don't miss it. Don't, go, don't go, say five years from now, you know, there was a time in which God was visiting us, but, but I, I didn't really jump in. I, I didn't really take the opportunity. How many will say in this house, I'm not going to miss this, what God's going to do. I'm not going to miss what God's going to do. I'm going to plant a seed out of my ashes, and I'm going to see God do something that I would never have ever expected or ever, ever anticipated. This is the time of visitation. When this thing begins to grow in, the, in, in your house, I, I plant a garden every year, so I'm always amazed that something grows. I always go and tell something. I always go up and say, the, the beans are up. The potatoes are up. They're coming. Let's not miss it. In the 
mighty name of Jesus, we say that out of the ashes is going to come some of the most beautiful, glorious flowers and plants. And they're going to produce seed after their own kind. And other seed is going to grow up and produce seed after its own kind. And we're going to lift up our head and say, Redemption has drawn nigh unto me and my house and my children and my grandchildren. And the redemption is coming to us today. We're not going to miss this visitation. Come on, all over the house. I'm not going to miss the, din- I'm not going to miss the visitation. Jesus is here. I'm not going to miss the visitation. His presence, His power, His outpouring. There's a visitation coming to Transformation Church. There's a visitation coming to this city. There's a visitation coming to Blair County. There's a visitation coming to the state of Pennsylvania. There's a visitation coming to America. God is going to visit us again. And out of the ashes of the conundrums of our our society, it's going to come a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. Lift up your voices. Lift up your heads. Your redemption is drawn. We are not going to miss the visitation. We're not going to miss it. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, receive the visitation now. We read your scripture. Isaiah 61 goes on. Then verse 10, it shifts a little bit. It says, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. How many know we don't delight in our ashes? We don't delight in our ashes. Stop celebrating your ashes. It's a word for somebody. Your ashes have become your claim to fame. And God says, quit rejoicing over your ashes. Quit claiming your ashes. Quit rejoicing in your ashes and rejoice in me. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He's arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Listen to this. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. As the soil makes the ground, the sprout come up and a garden causes the seed to grow, the God is going to cause righteousness to spring up. Come on. Somebody say, wow, you know, I got to got to I mean, anything is possible with God. Some of you think, that can't happen. That can't. Yeah, Pastor, you don't understand. It's been 32 years like this. Well, guess what? 32 years is over. Okay? You've been celebrating your ashes long enough. Time to start celebrating the beauty that you're going to give out of the ashes. It's kind of funny up here, isn't it? It's dirty up here now. People are, people are spilling stuff here, that dirt on the floor. Oh my goodness, a church is getting messed up. Oh no, the people are making the church dirty. Oh, we can't have that. We must be a Victorian parlor for the fastidious. And the, Good to have a little dirt in church. Come on, let's do this. I'm gonna do. This. I'm gonna ask you to do something. Come on. This song talks about anything is possible. Some of you lost hope. Some of you are used to the ashes. The ashes can become comfortable, I guess. But can we have a little bit of faith? cardboard or something. I don't know. Anyhow. Yeah, that. All right. I want you to do this. Get that thing in your hand. And this morning, come on, come up here with me. Take a step of faith. Come on, bring that thing and say, God, I'm bringing this thing. And I'm going to stand up here with other believers, like-minded believers. And we're going to believe together by faith 
that you're bringing beauty from ashes, that you're going to bring beauty out of ashes. I like how she came up, she came up with her cup and an offering. Praise the Lord, do that too. <laughs> that you come and say, God, you can do anything. Now listen to me. He can do the impossible. But how many know you're the redeemed that you have to cooperate with God to do what he wants you to, he wants to do in your life? Right? You're combining your faith with what his promise is. That's what you're doing today. You're saying, God, I believe anything is possible. So we're going to sing this song in celebration and also a declaration out of our mouth of who and what we believe our God is. Come on, Troy. The song says, by the Spirit I will rise from the ashes of defeat. The tragic story of Tamar, because we don't have it all, is we were left with her being a desolate woman in her brother's house. But you are not Tamar. You are no Tamar this morning. You might have had Tamar moments. You may have had somebody that came into your life. You may have been rendered a defeat here and there. But you are no modern day Tamar because you will rise from the ashes of defeat. You will not live as a desolate woman all of your life. You will not live as a desolate man all of your life. You will not live in ashes all of your life. The spirit of the living God breathes on you. The Spirit of the living God lives in you, and He will raise you up from defeat. He will raise you up. Defeat is not your story. It is a chapter of the book, but it is not the totality of the book. It is not the totality. It is a chapter. And what do you do when you read a chapter? You go to the next chapter. And the Spirit of the living God says, move from that chapter. Move from that chapter. I got other chapters to write. I got chapters I have that you don't even know about. I got chapters I'm writing by my Spirit. I got chapters I want to write that will blow your mind away. You've closed the book and I wasn't finished writing. You finished the book thought I was done. And you closed it and put away. I don't care that you're 85. I don't care that you're 75. I don't care how old you are. I'm not done with the book. I'll be done with the book when you don't have any breath in your lungs. Get this in your spirit. God says, I'm not done writing. I'm not done. I'm not done. You had a few chapters. You had a chapter at the beginning of the book that you had nothing to do with. You had a chapter at the beginning of the book that I, God had nothing to do with. You had a chapter at the beginning of the book that somebody else wrote into your life. The enemy of your soul. But I wrote, even into that chapter, a redemptive plan. And then you had a few chapters of your own making. But I got a redemptive plan for those chapters as well. And you thought I was done with you. And you think you know, you'd close the book. But I, the Lord, say to you, I'm the Lord of the book. I'm the author of the rest of the book. And I will write chapters that will blow your mind. Because you are planting with the display of my glory. I'm going to take the ashes and I'm going to make something beautiful.